I am beginning to read at the ninth verse of the 26th chapter. Listen for God's holy word. Paul speaking. I really thought that I ought to oppose the name of Jesus the Nazarene in every way possible. And that is exactly what I did in Jerusalem. I locked up many of God's holy people in prison under the authority of the chief priest. When they were condemned to death, I voted against them. In one synagogue after another, indeed, in all the synagogues, I would offer torture them, compelling them to slander God. My rage bordered on the hysterical as I pursued them, even to foreign cities. On one such journey, I was going to Damascus with the full authority of the chief priest. While on the road at midday, King Agrippa, I saw a light from heaven shining around me and my traveling companions. That light was brighter than the sun. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice that said to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you harassing me? It's hard for you to kick against a spear. Then I said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord replied, I am Jesus, whom you are harassing. Get up. Stand on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as my servant and witness of what you have seen and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to open their eyes. Then they can turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are made holy by faith in me. God's holy word. Snoopy of the Peanuts comic strip fame is sitting on top of his doghouse and he is writing yet another novel. And he begins... It was a dark and stormy night. He begins all his novels the same way. It is a dark and stormy night. And as he puts those words to the pages before him, Lucy walks by, she overlooks over his shoulder and sees the words he has written and she begins to berate him. Lucy says, Snoopy, don't you know that all great novels begin once upon a time? The next frame shows Snoopy beginning again, adding words to a blank page once upon a time. It was a dark and stormy night. Many of us understand Snoopy. We understand what a dark and stormy night is like. For many of us have a dark and stormy night in our own hearts. And often the turmoil is from a sense of guilt. We know that we have failed someone. We have hurt someone. And it weighs heavy upon us. Our souls are restless from the sense of guilt and from the shame of our behavior. Lucy doesn't understand that a clever turn of phrase does not settle the storm. In 34 years of ministry, I have come to believe that most of us, including me, are people who walk around with some degree of guilt on our backs. We are guilty for what we have done, and we feel guilty for what we have not done. And the guilt weighs so heavily upon us that our shoulders drop and our eyes become heavy, and you can tell that life has been diminished because of the guilt and the shame that we walk with. In a former congregation that I served, not this one, a man came to my office after he returned from a business trip and he confessed to me that while he was away he slept with another woman, not his wife. He committed adultery and the shame and the embarrassment was suffocating him. He was so disappointed in himself that he asked me, would you tell my wife? She respects you. She would take it better from you than from me. That was cold for the man saying that he no longer had any self-respect left inside of him. He knew that his wife deserved better and he let her down. And then he said, there is nothing that my wife can say or do to me to make me feel worse 
than how I feel right now. This shame of my behavior will weigh upon me for the rest of my life. And many of us understand exactly what he's talking about. We may not all be guilty of adultery, but many of us are guilty of something that we've done or left undone that weighs upon our conscience. It is a heavy load for us to carry, the load of shame as we try to make it through this day and all of our tomorrows. In some places in New England, there are graveyards that have a stone fence that runs right through the middle of them. Do you know that the reason there's a stone wall or fence right through the graveyard in some places is so that baptized babies may be buried on one side and babies who have died that were not baptized are buried on the other side. I wish I was making this up, but it is absolutely true. The practice is no longer done, but the thinking was in the early Christian community of New England was that they wanted to help Jesus out when Jesus came back in the second coming to know who to raise from the dead and who would not receive the resurrection. Friends, what that communicates to me and communicates to you is, is that the church has always had a sense that we all fall short of what God desires for us. That we all are not good enough for God. And the church of Jesus Christ has not been that helpful to those who are carrying a load of guilt or shame. Sometimes the church is overly conservative. And if I was one of those conservative pastors, it would be my job to stand up here Sunday after Sunday to remind you that you are not doing good enough. That you have somehow disappointed God again this week. And that you need to try harder. That would be my job if I came from that tradition of the Christian faith. And that kind of preaching would only seek to deepen your woundedness. It would not help you at all. Because that kind of preaching sets a standard that is too high for any of us to reach. And we know we can't get there. Not by our own strength we can't. And so for me to preach that you must do a better job this coming week is not faithful to the scriptures at all. For none of us can aspire to those standards by our own strength. So we experience more woundedness more guilt, more shame. Or what we do is we put on nice clothes and we go to church on Sunday morning and we say our prayers and we somehow pretend that we are not all that bad and yet we live with a fear that someone might find out our deep, dark secrets and we hope, oh darn, we hope that no one knows the truth about us. Maybe if I just pretend long enough even I can believe that I'm good enough. And then you have those progressive churches that create a no guilt zone. The pastor will stand up and say, there is no guilt here. Friends, you do not need to continue to beat yourself up. You have done nothing that is really seriously wrong as long as you are sincere and authentic and you show respect to other people. Whatever standards you set for yourself, that's okay for you. But that teaching completely ignores John the Baptist standing in the wilderness proclaiming repentance, which is a $5 word for meaning stop what you're doing and turn around and go in the other direction. It completely ignores Jesus Christ speaking to the woman caught in adultery and saying, I forgive you, but stop it. Don't do that anymore. That kind of progressive preaching does not sync with the message of the New Testament. So if we are not to preach a conservative gospel where we set standards that are too high for any of us to aspire to by our own strength, and if we are not to pro preach a progressive gospel that says everything is okay as long as you're sincere and authentic and respectful, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
What is to be my message as I stand here week after week proclaiming Christ to you? Well, Paul shows us a third way. In fact, Paul shows us Christ's way. This reading from the book of Acts that I just shared with you is the third time, the third time that Paul is sharing his conversion story. And every time he shares this conversion story, he holds nothing back. He does not gloss over any of the details. He lays it out for you. He says, I persecuted Christians. I hunted them down. I'll go wherever I can find them, and I hunted them down, and I arrest them, and I put them in prison. And then when they were condemned to death, I voted against them. Others I would torture, and I would torture to the point where I'll say, I can ease up on the torture if you'll slander your God. And unless you slander your God, the torture will continue, and the pain will become worse and worse. And when the Christians try to flee from me to other cities and to other nations, I pursued them. And even acknowledges that Paul became hysterical in his pursuit of Christians so that he could destroy the followers of Jesus Christ. He confesses it all. He confesses it all with all of its glory detail. But if you pay attention to the three times he tells the story of his conversion, not one word of guilt is mentioned. Not any shame is experienced. Not one word of dark remorse comes from the lips of Paul. So how does Paul live a life without shame when he has confessed all that he has done to the Christians before his conversion? Here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's right here in the conversion story. And the words that I read to you, pay attention again to what happens. He is on horseback with other men, and they're on the road to Damascus, where he is going to hunt down other Christians and have them imprisoned and tortured and put to death. And a light suddenly surrounds them, knocking them from their horses to the ground. And then a voice speaks, Saul. What are you doing? That question is demanding that Paul account for himself. To acknowledge what it was that he was engaged in doing. If we are to live a life without shame, it begins with us being honest. Absolutely honest with our lives. Honest when we have cheated on our spouse. Honest when we have cheated on our income tax. Honest when we have cheated those who have come and purchased goods from us if we are a business owner. It demands that we are completely honest about our behavior at this moment in time. What are you doing, Paul? And then what happens next is ever so important. Jesus Christ said, stand up on your feet. Stand up, Paul. Jesus tells Paul to stand up on his own feet because only on his feet can he return to God. Jesus says to Paul, stand up on your feet. I'm going to give you a different direction to go in. Do you notice that Jesus does not take Paul's guilt to oppress him? Jesus takes Paul's guilt to change him and to show him a different way to go. And it is then that Paul is able to say, I now can declare that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, the Bible tells us that when we experience guilt and shame, it is largely from the perceived judgment, not of others, but of God. We believe that God is condemning us because we have cheated on our marriage vows and we have cheated the customer and we have failed to do those things that we should have done but we did not do. We believe that God 
is ashamed of us and that God is condemning us. And that is where our shame comes from. But Paul discovers that God is not condemning Paul. God is saying, stand up. You are now to go in a different direction. And that's what repentance is all about. To stop what you're doing and to go in a different direction. Paul does not speak a word of guilt for his awful behavior to the Christian church. Paul experiences no shame because God does not make him feel guilty. God does not draw shame from him. God says, I have another way for you. A wonderful story during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson and some other men were on horseback. They were traveling along a trail and they come to a large creek. And there's a man standing on the side of the creek wondering how he can get across because the creek was so large. And as Thomas Jefferson and the other men approached the creek on horseback, the man looked up and he asked, President, would you give me a ride across these waters? Thomas Jefferson helped him onto the back of the horse, carried him across the creek, and then allowed him to get off. A man on the other side, watching the whole thing, said, Do you know, sir, who brought you across these waters? No, I don't. Why, it's the President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. You didn't know it was the President? I didn't know. Well, of all the men that were on horseback together, why did you ask him to carry you across the waters? And the man said, because he had a yes face. The scriptures point to a God that has a yes face. The face of God is not one that condemns us for our sins. The face of God is not one that wants us to feel guilt because we have fallen short. The face of God is not one that is asking for us to experience shame and undue measure for our behaviors. The face of God is a yes face. A face that says, stand up. Don't do that anymore. Come to me. Walk in the path that I will show you. And you will have a life without any shame whatsoever. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for the gospel that shows us that we are not to be a people who walk with guilt or shame only a people who constantly look to you to show us the path we are to walk. We praise you that you use our guilt to teach us how to change and that by the Holy Spirit you give us the strength to walk in your way. So we ask for this gift again today. Grant each of us freedom from guilt, from the weight of shame, the knowledge that you love us and that you have a yes face and walk us now steadily toward you. For we ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit come upon every one of us and remain this day and always. Amen.